Hi everyone, I'm Joanne Gabriel and on behalf of the Darien Library, we welcome you to our program this afternoon, New York National Historic Sites and the History They Tell with Alan Dupre. Alan returns for the final episode of our eight part series to talk about Grant's tomb. Grant's tomb is the largest mausoleum in the United States. It is the burial place of the general who was called in his time, the savior of the union who defeated the Confederacy and became the most important civil rights president between Lincoln and Lyndon Johnson. Before we begin, I would like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this possible and our collections available to the community. Our presenter this afternoon has been a seasoned lecturer of programs about our national parks and historic locales for over 20 years, focusing on important issues of universal and American values. A retired United States park ranger, he has delivered speeches to American and international audiences about famous sites such as Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty. Please welcome Alan Dupre. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here to talk about one of my favorite people would be Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, there is his picture. And uh, before uh, I talk about uh, certain things, we're going to start out with a with a slide that uh, may be rather interesting. Uh, that is a picture of Ulysses S. Grant, and I believe the next slide was going to uh, show you some points about Grant uh, that uh, are misconceptions or truths, whatever. Uh, it's what people think about him. Right? Well, that's interesting because we left Grant's nice picture just to see Ulysses S. Grant drunkard, butcher, failure in business, corrupt president, big cigar smoker, died of throat cancer, anti-Semitic, gullible, and an ignoramus. Uh, and uh, that might, might sound uh, rather harsh, and it is. And uh, when I was a kid going to school and to high school, I uh, uh, didn't hear this, that kind of descriptions of Grant, but I've heard it quite a bit from people who were coming into Grant's tomb and, uh, and uh, talking about their negative uh, impressions of him. I often started my talk uh, bringing this up. Uh, and so we're going to clarify uh, all of these things, I hope. Uh, now, after we've just seen that, uh, we see uh, the three great uh, figures, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Ulysses S. Grant. And he is the defender, Lincoln the martyr, and George Washington the father. So someone that uh, starts with all those negatives, uh, uh, rather uh, many people in the past had a very much higher opinion of him. And hopefully now we do as well. That is his funeral, over a million uh, people attended. And there they are in New York. And of course the great monument in his honor. And let us have peace. Uh, that is above the door, the portal, uh, under the dome uh, of, the, of Grant's tomb. And that is actually how he uh, ended the letter uh, in 1867, 1868, excuse me, when the, uh, he was nominated for president uh, by the uh, Republican convention. In those days, presidents did not go to the convention. They sent their, uh, their uh, agreement uh, by letter, and that's just what he did. Another view of Grant's tomb. And again, and there is uh, the two figures uh, above the portal there uh, set with this, let us have peace. Importance of him. As a uh, general and as a president, and his dates are there, 1822 to 1885, four-star general, one of the greatest in history, often called the savior of the union. 
He was president of the United States and he supported for the most part, the radical Republican agenda, which was to, uh, to uh, protect and to enhance the rights of the newly and freed slaves, the freedmen. Uh, he also was a peacemaker with Great Britain. Some people called for war with Great Britain after the Civil War because they had been a supporter of the Confederacy and, and uh, also left the uh, two war. They also were building uh, they privately, not the government wasn't officially, uh, warships in British docks for the Confederacy. A and those warships uh, were released. Uh, the United States protested and tried to stop them. They were built in, in uh, British shipyards and launched, and they caused a great deal of damage to Northern shipping. Uh, so he was to negotiate that as president and to solve that problem. Uh, he said he didn't, he, he didn't like unnecessary wars and wasn't going to go to uh, uh, war with Great Britain unless there was arbitration. And he called for international arbitration and it was done. And uh, the, uh, it, it was found in the United States favor. And I believe the British paid an indemnity of about $8 million and admitted that, they, I don't think they ever admitted they were wrong though, but they agreed to pay. <laughs> and of course, he was known as a great writer because of his memoirs of the Civil War, his autobiography, which is considered some of the best ever written by a general and president. And that basically described his years at, in the United States Army and as a general. Here is where he was born in 1822. And that would be uh, April 27. His parents were Hiram, uh, were, excuse me, his parents were uh, Jesse Grant and Hannah Grant. His father was a tanner uh, and he did very well. Uh, and uh, so that, uh, Ulysses S. Grant had a fairly prosperous upbringing. I'm going back to them for a minute. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant uh, hated to be around the tannery. And unfortunately, the tannery was right by the house. So he tried to avoid that odor all his life. He couldn't stand the smell of it. It was a messy business. And so he would do anything to get out of uh, hanging around there. Uh, or working there. And so uh, he loved horses and, and he, uh, from a young child, he went out in a wagon and uh, with help collected wood for the tannery. You needed a lot of uh, boiling water, et cetera. Uh, and uh, so uh, that was one of his jobs, but he did not want to work in the tannery at all. It says in one of the readings that he complained about it all the time. There he is as president, and as general, and uh, he was known uh, to look rather sloppy, <laughs> as you can see from this uh, photograph. Uh, and that at uh, at Appomattox Courthouse, uh, uh, General Lee came to uh, to the surrender, uh, meticulously dressed, etc. And uh, Grant had cigar ashes down his uh, coat, etc. There is a story about him uh, uh, when he was uh, a, a cadet and uh, he came back home in his uniform as a young man. And some girls that he knew started laughing at him and making fun of him. And uh, when he when they, they did that, he was meticulously dressed, etc. So it must have caused some kind of uh, problem, I guess, about uh, uh, overdressing. So uh, <laughs> so he didn't pay too much attention to that. He didn't like to be laughed at. I guess no one does. Uh, also, uh, when he was a child, uh, he was not a a. Uh, he wasn't that great in school, but at West Point, he uh, was uh, in the middle in his grades. 
So he wasn't the highest marks or the lowest, but right almost exactly halfway in the middle. And uh, there's a story about him when he was a young child. Uh, he is going to reflect on the idea that he was not a very good businessman later on, and maybe even worse. He loved horses. Uh, he had an empathy for them. It was almost spiritual, people said. Uh, he could do tricks on the horses. He did them at West Point uh, for the entertainment of the other cadets. A and so he, the neighbor, far neighbor farmer was selling a horse, which Grant liked. And uh, so he got his father to agree for him to buy it and uh, for $25. And that's all he had. So his father said, well, uh, I will uh, give you some advice. This is what you're to do. You go to see farmer and you say to him, uh, I'm going to offer you uh, $15 for that horse. And if he, re if he declines, if you, when, when you try to negotiate with him and he says no, uh, then you can offer him $20. And uh, if he still resists and says no, he needs more than that, then your final offer, and it's all you have, would be $25. So Grant said, okay. And he went to buy the horse. And he said to uh, the farmer, uh, I, I came here to buy your horse. And, and uh, I got some advice from my father. My father told me that I should tell you that uh, I would pay $15 for the horse. And if you don't agree, I would say, uh, well, I'll pay 20. And uh, finally, uh, if you don't agree to that, I offer you the $25, that's all I have. So the farmer uh, said, well, give me $25 and you have the horse. <laughs> so that, was, that story was brought up many times in his life. And um, some people say his father thought after that story that uh, Grant needed uh, some help. Uh, intellectually. Now, his father wanted all, all his sons educated, uh, and he decided to try to get uh, uh, his uh, son uh, educated by sending him to West Point. So he got his friend, a congressman, or an ex-friend, uh, and, and then they became friends again uh, to recommend Ulysses S. Grant, which he did. And that's how he got into West Point. More pictures of Grant during the Civil War. And with Robert E. Lee uh, at Surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, uh, one thing about Grant is that he suffered from migraine headaches terribly. And just before he got the uh, word that uh, Lee was coming, and he, he said, Lee wants an, a, a meeting with you, and Grant knew it was for a surrender. And um, that he said his uh, migraine, he was out uh, walking by himself, uh, dissipated. He, was, he knew that it was the end of the war. And uh, he was thinking about it. And he said to himself, basically, because he wrote this all out, and I'm paraphrasing, as, as, uh, 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 but he basically said, I thought I should be happy. Uh, and why wasn't I? Because the war had been won, of course, at great, great cost and uh, to both sides. And he said, to, he said uh, I thought that, well, I saw with what great passion the Lee and his soldiers and the Confederacy fought for their cause. Unfortunately, it was the worst cause that anyone could ever fight for, and there was no excuse for it. And he always felt that way. And he believed that the, the, uh, the South never really realized that though he was very magnanimous to uh, General Lee and his soldiers. And this is the opening of Grant's tomb in 1897. Uh, big, big deal up there on a, a 122nd Street along Riverside. And you could see the big difference between New York then and today. Another view. I love uh, looking at pictures of the tomb. Uh, I, I'm going to pretty build pretty fast over the military things. Uh, 
and uh, he graduated from the academy uh, in in eighteen forty three or four. Uh, and he was assigned to the 4th Infantry and reported to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis County, uh, Missouri. And uh, there he was to visit the Dent family. Uh, Dent was a friend of his at West Point, and he went there, and he actually had been his roommate, Fred Dent, and uh, he was invited to visit, and he did. That's where he was going to meet his future wife. We'll talk more about her in a bit. There is a, a, a watercolor, I believe, of Grant as a cadet. There's a photograph of him at the time. A rather Looks like a rather dashing figure, very neat and put together. Uh, he spent um, uh, time in the war, the Mexican war, and uh, that was in uh, 1846, 44 to 46. Now, he was a quartermaster, uh, which is supplying the troops and in supply. And, but uh, he did his best to join every battle and they let him, every battle he could, of course. And he did with uh, quite a bit of bravery. At one time, he helped to uh, uh, put out of action a gun that was up in a, a church tower, I believe, uh, with, uh, with quite a bit of bra bravery. So he was involved in the battles. One interesting thing about Grant is that he was never wounded, ever. So, uh, and also, he hated the smell or the sight of blood. How that, how he was able to get through the wars he was in with that condition, I don't know. He, he it said that even uh, red meat or rare steak or whatever, and the blood surrounding it would get him sick to his stomach. But <laughs> it's uh, interesting things about many people and what they can handle and not. Uh, and this is the, the battle uh, of, uh, let's see, is that the same one? Yes, that's another view of that. And of course, the Battle of Chapultepec, and that was one of the big battles of the war. He was involved with that as well. And the Battle of Buena Vista. All of those battle, he, uh, battles were, he was involved in and fought in. Uh, he was not happy with the Mexican War. He said the war was uh, started basically by the United States and pushed by the Southerners who wanted more slave states. And he also wrote later on that he believed that the Civil War was uh, almost a punishment for us fighting that unjust war. Interesting for a great general uh, of this country uh, to feel that way. Of course, we have some maps of the battles of the war and, and uh, the new land, uh, Texas and uh, California uh, became a part of the United States, as well as New Mexico and Arizona. Now, interestingly enough, while he was there, he painted this. And this. Oops, and this. When he was at West Point, part of the training there is to learn how to draw uh, and watercolor as well. Because in those days, if when you went out scouting and uh, you were looking for land formations uh, where there's possibility of you being attacked or ambushed or what have you, you wanted to see the lay of the land. So you were able to draw uh, the landscape. So that's where he learned how to draw. Uh, I don't know how many paintings he did. I don't think he continued with too many the rest of his life. I haven't read about him spending his free time painting when he was retired, but he was quite accomplished, I believe. This is his, uh, uh, the Dent family plantation. Doesn't look like a grand plantation, uh, but it, uh, the Dent family was prosperous, prosperous, uh, and they had uh, quite a few slaves 
Uh, and uh, this was their plantation house. And this, I believe, is a, a uh, federal site today in, for the Park Service. Now, he adored Julia. Uh, uh, he asked her to marry her soon after he met her. She said, well, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, we'll have to wait. Uh, but it turned out to be a lifelong romance, and he adored her. And uh, let's see, my dear Julia, you can have but little idea of the influence you have over me even while so far away, and thus it is absent or present. I am more or less governed by what is your will. I believe that was written during the Mexican War. A letter arrived with two dried flowers inside, and when Grant opened it, the petals scattered to the wing, winds. He searched for them in the dry sands and found none, so he wrote, before I seal this, I will pick a wild flower of the bank of the Rio Grande and send it to you. In another, he wrote, you say in your letter, I must grow tired of hearing you say how much you love me. Indeed, dear Julia, nothing you can say sounds sweeter. When I lay down, I think of Julia until I fall asleep, hoping that before I wake, I may see her in my dreams. So it was quite a, a love match there. There she is with her daughter, Nellie. Uh, the little boy on the side is one of the four sons. I'm not quite sure her, who, and that is uh, her father, Colonel Dent, I believe, who was pro-Southern, uh, which is rather interesting. Uh, and uh, so he had a, a son-in-law as one of the greatest generals and very much responsible for defeating the Confederacy. There she is with two of the children, probably in the 1850s. One of those is probably Jesse. And there she is as first lady. She looks rather formidable, but uh, by all accounts, she was a charming lady. She also had a wandering eye and uh, sort of being cross-eyed, I guess they would say today. And, uh, and uh, so she, in some of the photographs, they sort of, they always do her on the side a bit and not full. This one gives you an idea, you get a, an idea of that. And in the, uh, when Grant was president, they actually had an, uh, an operation that, uh, uh, that could cure that. But it was dangerous, and she was. She she asked her husband. Uh, she said, she, "I would really like to have this operation." And uh, and uh, what do you think? And he said, basically, "I uh, uh, I love you just the way you are, and don't change." Uh, and so she didn't have it done. But he knew uh, most likely that it was uh, you were taking your eyesight, at least in one eye. Uh, you, it might, you might lose it. So therefore that was, he, he, would, he didn't want that to happen. Civil War, 1861-65. There is a very romantic uh, painting of uh, Grant with many of the generals, Sheridan, Sherman, et cetera. And they're all riding away, uh, riding off uh, to meet the, uh, their destiny. And there they are. Now, uh, this looks like Vicksburg. We'll talk about that in the middle. Uh, the uh, battle that made his name was the Battle of Fort Donelson, and that was fought very early in the war. And uh, it, it, he, they, the Union troops won that battle, and this was in the time, or in 1862, very early, early in the war when the United States was not doing so well. And uh, he captured quite a few uh, of the Confederate forces there. A and uh, when the Confederate general, General Simon Boulevard Buckner, uh, was ready to surrender, he said, what are your conditions? And Ulysses S. Grant, unconditional surrender. <laughs> So the press, the Northern press took that up. Again, this was a bleak time. Most, uh, most of the battles were lost by the Union forces. And that became Grant's name, Unconditional Surrender Grant. 
and it fit with his initials, U.S. Grant or Uncle Sam Grant. At, at West Point, they kidded him about that. Uh, so uh, that was uh, one of the things uh, that uh, caused quite a stir in the North and gave them a lot of hope that the, the defeat of the Confederacy and the saving the Union would happen. This is Vicksburg, uh, the bombardment of Vicksburg. Vicksburg, of course, was on the Mississippi River and it blocked uh, shipping uh, down to uh, uh, Louisiana, to New Orleans. It also blocked the movement of troops. And the idea was to divide the Confederacy in half. This was Lincoln and Grant's uh, idea to do so. And to do so, you would have to conquer Vicksburg, whose guns controlled that section of the Mississippi River. So a siege was started uh, and uh, bombarding it, and it wasn't working out too well. And so uh, Grant came up with the idea of all sorts of other ideas that he had tried, like building a canal to do uh, to enter through be behind and take his uh, soldiers by boat that way. That didn't work. So it was decided that gunboats would, uh, would uh, go down past Vicksburg and its heavy guns uh, and take a chance. At, before though, they had uh, carried over the Union forces to the other side of the river. They marched down past Vicksburg the gunboats went uh, 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 past Vicksburg by the Mississippi River and they were bombarded. And, uh, but they got through. Many you could see are ironclad boats. And so they were able to transport the soldiers across and take uh, Vicksburg through, from behind uh, because uh, the other way was a big swamp, et cetera. So it was a success. I believe it was July 3rd. Uh, 1863, uh, that, uh, that says April 16th under the picture, but that's uh, when they ran the rebel blockade there of the river. Uh, but uh, it probably was just as important, if not more important than Gettysburg, which happened at the same time. They were pretty much parallel to each other and the dates of those battles were the same month, pretty much very close by the same uh, day. Uh, but Vicks, uh, excuse me, Gettysburg got more of the uh, attention and it still does, but Vicksburg was very important and the Confederacy was divided in half. The idea, which was really going to be the best strategy and it took a little longer to do that, was to coordinate all the attacks against the Confederacy in the West and the East uh, uh, so that they could not reinforce or send help uh, from one place to the other because if they, you were being attacked in the East, they could not be sending uh, troops further to the West. You'd have to be pretty much on your own. And that was eventually going to succeed by these coordinated attacks. So Germ uh, uh, Sherman's attack uh, uh, or march through Georgia was part of that I idea. That of course was done in 1864. Wilderness campaign, this was a bloody nasty campaign going through the uh, uh, swamps, et cetera, on the way to Virginia, to uh, Richmond, to uh, towards the end of the war. Grant was the gentleman responsible, constant battles, with uh, Robert E. Lee and, and Grant and the Union forces. Uh, devastating, uh, gruesome. There were many battles in the Civil War and sometimes Grant's reputation went down because of the casualties, uh, but he always was able to bounce back because he was a success. And uh, here is a very romantic picture. This might be uh, Vicksburg. It might be uh, right after the wilderness campaign, et cetera. Uh, but there, there is Grant and being cheered by the troops. 
Now, again, like I say, this is a very skimpy uh, view of the Civil War. Basically, Grant's tomb emphasizes, or the interpretation there, the Rangers program emphasizes Grant as a president. And uh, so that the Civil War is part of it, uh, but uh, they emphasize, and I agreed with that, I like the idea, uh, because a lot of looking at Grant's presidency uh, had a lot to do with changing the reputation he has today. So he was known as a great general. Uh, the Southerners called him a butcher, that if Lee had more troops and more supplies, he would have won. Uh, Lee, uh, of course, uh, uh, his decisions, many of them were responsible for lots of casualties as well, some of them unnecessary. So both of them were uh, pretty tough guys. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Grant had uh, met Lee uh, during the Mexican War. I believe Lee, Lee, of course, was a graduate of West Point. And, uh, 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 but he was uh, before Ulysses S. Grant, but Grant had met him at, uh, during the Mexican War and uh, one of them brought it up. Uh, and uh, Grant said about Lee, Lee had this fantastic reputation as being almost semi-godlike. And uh, he was asked uh, why he was not intimidated by Lee and his reputation as a great military man. Even at West Point, he had no demerits, uh, Lee. <laughs> for the four years he was there. And he said, well, I looked him up. I looked at him. Uh, I knew of his reputation. Uh, I saw how he, he behaved and I realized he was only a man. Basically, he was a man like everybody who is a, is a human being, is a human being. He's a man and he made mistakes like everybody else. The idea was to find out his weaknesses by uh, watching him and responding to them. And so that was Grant's attitude towards uh, Lee's reputation. Reconstruction and 18th president of the United States. And uh, uh, Grant had a reputation and, and uh, there's so much to cover and I will skim through a lot of things. Uh, Grant was president from 1869 to 1877. He had two terms. Uh, he was idolized in the North and, he, and because of his magnanimous terms to uh, Lee at uh, Appomattox Courthouse, he let the Confederates keep their horses. He uh, gave them supplies and foods food to take with them when uh, to return to their uh, their homes uh and uh, so that was remembered uh but uh, grant uh, uh, was very much against uh andrew johnson uh, andrew johnson uh, of course was uh, abraham lincoln's successor because of course uh, abraham lincoln was assassinated even though Abraham Lincoln had a very lenient uh, uh, or came up with the idea uh, uh, for, for uh, reconstruction in the South, it was a very lenient one. Uh, and, uh, but it wasn't set in stone. And uh, who knew what would have happened if, uh, if he had lived? Uh, he would wanted uh, uh, to be as magnanimous as possible to the South and, and, and Grant did as well. Grant as, uh, as military leader, uh, many, of, his, many uh, of the slaves, the enslaved were running away, crossing union lines to escape enslavement. And uh, what do you do with them? Some people said, well, you can't do anything with them. You can't work with them. Ulysses S. Grant uh, said, no, that's really ridiculous. Uh, we'll put them to work with us. And uh, the idea that uh, they were not able to work was ridiculous since they had worked so hard as the enslaved in the South. 
And uh, then the idea came up of uh, perhaps uh, arming them and putting them in the army. And Grant pushed that idea as well. He saw uh, their metal and uh, he knew or believed by observing that they would make good soldiers. And so they were. They were enlisted in the Union Army by many thousands. There were about 200,000 uh, uh, free slaves uh, in the Union forces. And Grant was to remember that. He saw what good soldiers they were. He saw how necessary they were to shorten the war not only as soldiers, but the more enslaved that ran away from the South, less people to work on the plantations, growing the food uh, uh, and uh, uh, growing the cotton, et cetera. And so, uh, and all the things that uh, hard labor that they did. And uh, so they, it worked out very well. Anyway, let's go on. Surrender of General Lee, victory, liberty, triumphant. And then of course, Abraham Lincoln's assassination so soon afterwards. Now, uh, some of the Union dead, or it might even be Confederate dead. Uh, but uh, uh, initially, uh, when I was going to high school in the 1960s, basically they said the the uh, casualties, the deaths, more uh, in the Civil War, were about 600,000 altogether on both sides. It's been it's been raised. It's about 750,000 now are the est estimates of how many died in the Civil War. And you have what was the United States? A population of 30 million. So this was a very large percentage. Well, not very large. But it was quite, it's not like it was 300 million people in the United States and 750,000 died in a war. Uh, so uh, this was quite a devastating thing as far as deaths and cost. And here you go, here's more. And of course, one of the, this might be Arlington at one of the battlefields. Uh, this is uh, Richmond. Now, I believe the Confederates, as they were leaving, uh, blew up the town. And they also, this is another example, but this is uh, Columbia, South Carolina. And, they, and the Confederates did that as well. They also did that at Atlanta. So in the famous scene of, the, of uh, Gone, In Gone with the Wind, the burning of Atlanta was done by the retreating Confederate troops. So this is the devastation of the city of, of Richmond. Other cities were like this. Uh, many plantations devastated, destroyed, had to be rebuilt, redone. So there you go. And of course, uh, Abraham Lincoln was followed by Andrew Johnson who had been, I believe, a senator from Tennessee. Uh, and he was the only Southern senator, except for those in the border states, uh, who did not join his uh, other, the other Southern senators and leaving and uh, going for secession. And he became, I believe, the governor of uh, Tennessee once the Union forces had taken it over. And uh, so he was a pro-union Democrat and he was picked in a, a, a union, uh, uh, pro-union, uh, shall we say, idea for the election, uh, sort of like a government which has a member of the other side, even though as far as being pro-Confederate, he was not totally a pro-union man, uh, beside, even with all his faults. Now, after the Civil War, this is, uh, and this is, uh, I know uh, we're, uh, there's a lot to talk about, uh, but uh, this is a, a political cartoon. 
uh, about the North's view of the South. And as you see, uh, the Southern gentleman uh, soldier is shaking hands with a much wounded Union veteran. Uh, he still has his foot on the grave of the Union soldier in memory of Union heroes in a useless war. And there's devastation all around him. Uh, now remember, probably weren't many families or individuals in the North who didn't know someone uh, who, uh, relative, friend, who was a soldier in the war uh, uh, or, and who died or was horribly wounded. And uh, I guess you could say the same thing about the Confederacy. The only problem is that Andrew Johnson was a big racist and as president after the Civil War, he started pardoning uh, many of the uh, Confederate uh, elites, pardoning them. Uh, and he thought that the, the Southern Confederate states should be back in the Union or really had never left. And uh, they had to accept the 13th Amendment ending the enslavement, but that was it. So all of these pro-Confederate uh, state governments were put in place again. And in the elections of uh, 1866, many leaders of the Confederacy were uh, elected as senators and representatives to the United States Congress. Uh, and they, in their states, they had started passing the Black Codes that pretty much kept the freedmen enslaved. He was free in name only. Uh, you had to sign a contract with uh, your former uh, uh, owner uh, to work for him. If you didn't do that, you could wind up in jail in a chain gang. You had no rights to sue uh, or to testify or to uh, have an education, none of those things. And these black codes uh, were strictly enforced. Now that got many in the North angry, especially since here, the, the, those that had left the union and caused basically, they believe, these horrible casualties and destruction, here they were sending back the same leaders to the United States Senate and Congress and having themselves elected as governor, et cetera, the vice president of the Confederacy, Stevens, uh, he was sent back as a senator. So it enraged the people of the, the North. And uh, it was uh, a positive idea. The North, there was plenty of racism in the North, of course. But the idea was that the freedmen should have basic rights, the right to own property, the right to have their children educated, the right to sue in court, all of those things were people believe were the rights of everybody. So maybe the North wasn't so worried about having the uh, enslaved uh, voting. And, uh, and of course they believed they were superior for the most part to the uh, African American, but those basic rights uh, were believed in, in the North and also 200,000 black soldiers had fought on the side of the Union Army. And so they felt they owed something to them. And there are all kinds of horrible things happening, uh, attacks on uh, black soldiers in the South, riots and massacres of African-Americans uh, uh, on the streets of certain cities, et cetera. I'm not gonna go into all of that, it's a big subject. But again, here's another view, probably around the time of the election of 1866 uh, for Congress. And, uh, and uh, here is Republican principles, peace, uh, human rights, et cetera, and democratic principles, of course, because the Democratic Party, <laughs> I'm laughing and I don't mean to, uh, but had the reputation of being pro-Southern, and it was in many ways. They were very much anti-civil rights. Uh, 
for uh, for the uh, freedmen. Uh, and so pro-Southern for the most part, many of them had been copperheads during the Civil War, not all Democrats, but uh, many of them. And uh, so there was much anger against them. They used to say that uh, they used to call it uh, waving the bloody shirt. The Republicans did that all the time in elections. And they said, you don't wanna vote democratic. This is the party of rebellion. Well, there's something to that uh, as well. And of course the reputation of the South during reconstruction was not the greatest at all. Here's a, a photograph of some of the black troops we were talking about. After the war, the Freedmen's Bureau uh, tried to help the freedmen and also many poor whites to get an education. They helped them with, uh, uh, with uh, food at times to find jobs, et cetera. And it was much maligned by the Democrats in Congress and the South. Uh, this tells you that basically, even though this was the Freedmen's Bureau that it said to the freedmen that you need to get a job, we'll help you find one, but you have to get one. So there was some, shall we say, pressure there as well. But many of the uh, former enslaved didn't want to work on the plantation anymore. They wanted farms of their own. They wanted their children educated. Freedmen Bureau set up schools for the education of the children and even the adults of the freedmen and freedwomen. This is the old South. This was hopefully the new South. Uh, that is a Union uh, soldier, black soldier with his wife and two of his children, very middle class. And of course, here is Richmond uh, after the end of the war. Now, the um, this uh, etching by uh, by. Uh, uh, what's his name, Nast, about emancipation. And this was the view that people hoped would be accepted in the North as well as the South. Here is a African-American family, very middle-class. Papa sits in a chair, he's picking up his young child. There's the stove heating the place. It looks like a nice parlor. Uh, and below that, in contrast, how it had been in the past, uh, there is a slave on his knees. And up to the top on the left is devastation, war. And on the left side, you see a slave market. And below that, the lash, the whipping, the punishing of the enslaved. And on the right side of this, you see the schoolhouse. The freed, the freedmen, uh, uh, their children going to school, leaving a nice house, their mama, and going off to the local schoolhouse. And below that, uh, you see the uh, ex-slaves uh, going to get their wages, no longer working for nothing, working for someone else who had complete control over their lives. Photograph of a schoolhouse. Uh, the campaign of 1868. The next pictures may be a bit offensive, uh, but of course, here's General Grant and Vice President Colfax. And uh, <clears throat> this is some of the problems he was going to have to deal with, though this might be uh, in his second term. Uh, and uh, all kinds of problems, taxation, hard times because it was a depression. Uh, it says corrupt carpet bag, <clears throat> <clears throat> governments in the South, that's a big issue that as, is a subject of his own. Uh, and many people in the North, because there were problems with the revolution that was going on in the South during Reconstruction, African-Americans voting, African-Americans electing other African-Americans to sit in the state houses, to be elected to Congress. Uh, also, uh, many of the new projects and programs that the South, Southern governments under reconstruction, like public education, there wasn't any really uh, before uh, 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 antebellum South and the antebellum South and education, money, money was being spent. So there was corruption. There was uh, 
things that weren't the nicest things happening, but this was the Gilded Age as well, and there was plenty of corruption in the state houses in the North. Uh, so that any kind of uh, things that were not working out in, uh, in this new situation often were duplicated in the North as well. Now, this is what you might find offensive. It's probably, uh, you should, and this is from the election of 1866 in Shores These were congressional elections. And the Democrats were saying that, uh, and they made no apologies, that uh, the Republican Party was for the Negro, as they were called, or worse, and not the white man. So if you vote for Democrat, uh, this is uh, this this is what they're interested in is a a uh, stereotyped horrible racist vision of what an African American was. Here you go. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau was just a thing, a handout uh, for the ex enslaved, so they can lie around and do nothing. Totally baloney. Absolutely. First of all, it wasn't enough for anybody to be laying around doing nothing, no matter what your race was. And this is their view of the constitutional command, uh, uh, amendment, uh, uh, probably the 14th amendment at this time. And how, of course, this was just to take away the rights of the white man, uh, according to the Democrats at the time, uh, 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 and give rights to the, the, to the African African American, so that the idea was giving or having another group of people getting the same rights you have that somehow you were taking away from the group that was governing things before, uh, and that's what they played on. This is Grant's inauguration, and uh, since this is such a big subject, one of the things Grant did, uh, and all the problems he had to deal with. Uh, here, the Ku Klux Klan was formed, and the Ku Klux Klan's, Klan's purpose was to, to intimidate the freedmen, to keep them from voting, etc. So Ulysses S. Grant uh, was to use the newly formed uh, Justice Department uh, with uh, laws that were passed especially for that to go after the Ku Klux Klan actually using troops to uh, go into certain areas, arrest them and try them. And uh, a lot of good was done. Uh, the, Ku, uh, the Ku Klux Klan was broken in many places. They went underground as well. But in the, the election of what, 1872, uh, about 200, 300,000 African American men voted in those elections. And uh, so the intimidation of the, of the Klan uh, was much diminished. And they used anything, uh, fire, sword, murder, rape, to intimidate the freedmen and their wives and children. And of course, lynching. Uh, now the 15th Amendment, of course, gave the right vote to the freedmen, the males obviously not the women. And here is a poster, a celebration of that passing. And of course, here's some of the uh, African uh, American uh, senators and representatives uh, in the Congress. The first colored senator and representatives, and there you go. And uh, let me see, I believe, was that Revels? Yes, Senator Revels right here on the left was uh, the uh, uh, African-American who was elected to the Senate of the United States. And these other gentlemen are in the House of Representatives. Uh, this is another celebration of the 15th Amendment. There's the Senator again. And on the left, I can't make out his name, but that's Frederick Douglass in the middle, who was a admirer of Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, he believed uh, that Grant was uh, honest and fighting for the rights of the freedmen in the South. Uh, here, I, I'm not going to go into this one. This is a uh, this is a cartoon by Nast as well, showing all kinds of immigrants. This is in the 1870s, 
I believe that's Ulysses Grant up there. There you go. There's Grant to the right, George Washington the center, and Lincoln to the left. And you see Chinese, uh, Hispanics, African Americans, all sitting at the great table at the Thanksgiving dinner, all Americans, and po a po very positive view of an integrated society. This was a, uh, a, a African American lawyer, uh, J. Uh, John R. Ro H. Rocks. Fourteenth Amendment was very important too. No state shall make or enforce any law which denies to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of its laws. The Fourteenth Amendment actually uh, was interpreted, and I believe rightly so, to say that the Bill of Rights in the Constitution applied to everybody. No state, no state shall uh, 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 put anyone in danger and loss of property themselves, et cetera, without due process of law. And that was interpreted and, a big, and, and used very much to say that all of those rights, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, uh, gun rights, et cetera, applied to everybody and not to, uh, just something that the federal government could make no law abridging. 15th Amendment, African-American voting. As I say, 200,000 African-Americans or so voted in the 1872 election. Uh, and here's uh, Ulysses S. Grant's cabinet. That would be a, a cartoon of the early, a political cartoon of the early 1900s with TR saying justice for all. Civil Rights Bill was passed in 1875, uh, and that uh, was to give uh, equal rights or uh, uh, in uh, public accommodations. This is Eli Parker, Native American, Seneca Indian, who was in Grant, on Grant's staff in the uh, when during the Civil War, and he made him. Uh, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. The idea uh, in those days, the most the, the enlightened view was that you were to educate the Native Americans to be uh, United States, uh, uh, shall we say, accept the idea of uh, Western culture, want to be farmers, get educated, et cetera, and be integrated into American society. Uh, no one was, was saying that, oh, or very few were saying that, oh, we need to respect their culture. Grant was one of them. It was considered enlightened at the time uh, that you don't cheat Indians, Native Americans, and you also educate them and uh, push for them to be assimilated into the general society. And I'm not going to go through all of these uh, things that Grant accomplished. Uh, it's quite a list, as you can see. And of course, it's almost time to stop. Uh, and uh, he left office in 1877. Reconstruction pretty much ended uh, after him. It, well, it started to end. That's the Ku Klux Klan again firing into a cottage with uh, the, the, the uh, freedmen. Uh, Ackerman was the uh, new attorney general who prosecuted the Ku Klux Klan uh, during the Grant administration. And here is a view of Ulysses S. Grant and his family, uh, probably when he was president. There's three of his sons. Well, all, he had only son, three sons. He had a daughter as well, Frederick, Dan to the left, Ulysses S. Grant Jr., Jesse Root Grant, Nellie married an English minor gentry uh, gentleman there and who, who he was a drunker, drunkard and a womanizer, uh, but he died fairly young and left her a fairly wealthy widow, but her wedding in the White House was a big deal at the time. And that is the East Room uh, of the White House uh, and at, at the wedding, that's where she was where the ceremony took place. Nellie Grant's wedding breakfast menu on the state dining room, I had kicked reading this, but we don't have time. Woodcock and snipe on toast, soft crabs on toast, chicken croquettes, aspic of beef tongue, and it goes on and on. 
I wonder what the fancy cakes were on the bottom. A view of, of what room is this? Is this the blue room, uh, the oval room in the middle, in the White House in the 1870s, uh, another view of it as well. And there we go again. I believe that's the red or the green room. Does it look? That is, I believe that the one before was the red room. This is the green room. And that is a large painting of Grant and his family. So this obviously was during the presidency. This is the East Room at the time of his presidency. Some people call it a steamboat Gothic. That is where Nellie got married. There's another view of it as well. It's a dining room where General Grant and his wife uh, summered usually in Elberton, New Jersey, a wealthy uh, uh, admirer, let them use his uh, mansion on, on the coast. That's when it was being destroyed in the 1950s, I believe. Some of the plate made for the Grant administration in the White House. And there you go. And there's part of the cutlery there, U.S. Grant, President of the United States. A ceremonial sword, I think that was uh, dedicated to Grant by the Congress of the United States. After the presidency, he took a grand tour around the world, lasted a couple of years. He was lionized everywhere he went, especially in Europe, but in Asia as well, Japan and China. The Europeans followed the war, uh, at, at the Civil War. They uh, Most of the general population, the working man, the working woman, the lower classes supported the Confederacy and wanted the end of slavery. And they considered uh, the United States at the time as a beacon, even though it had many things that weren't working out well, of course, enslavement uh, before the war and a great big war fighting over this. Uh, it, there was progress there moving for justice for everybody. So that was quite admired in many parts of the world. I won't have, that's the boat he sailed on. Those are some of the people he met, including Queen Victoria, Emperor of Austria, Otto von Bismarck. He had an interesting talk with Bismarck, which I can't go into now. There's his tour. Uh, Egypt, uh, the, since he was a great horseman, uh, the Sultan of Turkey gave him two of these horses. Uh, uh, the, pa the panther and the linden tree. And of course they were brought back to America and, uh, and, and Grant of course kept them. As far as I know, there he is talking with Bismarck. Uh, this is a, a Japanese view of him meeting the em emperor of Japan. Also before he, he went to China, before he went to China, uh, he, he, uh, when he went to China, he was asked to uh, be a negotiator uh, to try to bring China and uh, uh, Japan together over islands off of the coast. Uh, and uh, they both claim them. And uh, the idea was to get some kind of compromise together to solve the problem. It didn't happen, uh, uh, but Grant warned the Chinese, em the Chinese emperor and also uh, the uh, Japanese emperor that uh, don't try to work together because the Europeans are out to uh, take over these uh, you guys. So you need to try to solve your problems and don't let the Europeans get involved. So that was good advice. He returned to the United States under great acclaim. His uh, death, that was his sheet music that was written in his honor. Uh, in 1884, he was diagnosed with throat cancer. Uh, he had lost a fortune uh, uh, in a scam, which he was pretty much totally innocent in. He had no idea one day he was rich. He listened to Ferdinand Ward, a big Ponzi scheme guy on Wall Street. He wasn't the only one who fell for this. It was pretty much through his son who worked for him uh, that he got caught up in this, a and uh, uh, Grant uh, and Fernando Ward also uh, convinced a lot of other big shots at the time uh, to invest in his company, and it totally went down the drain. Grant was uh, a millionaire one minute and had nothing left by the end of that. He was convinced 
uh, by Mark Twain to write his memoirs. Uh, he was diagnosed with cancer. And even while he was suffering greatly of cancer, he wrote these memoirs on his own. Uh, Mark Twain did not help him. And he said, uh, you know, I, he, Mark Twain had a publishing, he was going to publish them for him, give him a percentage. And now since uh, he got a percentage of each book sold, uh, it wound up making him about his, his family $250,000 or more. So his wife became a wealthy widow. This book was finished just a few days before he died. So it was published after his death. Grant Ed and uh, the uh, accolades to him, his personal memoirs, uh, considered some of the greatest memoirs of a general. This is where he died, upstate New York. They, they took him there. They lived in Manhattan. Uh, but the, he was taken up there uh, for the coolness of the summertime. It was very hot in New York. Hopefully this would help him and make him more comfortable. This is where he died. Uh, death scene, uh, his death mask. There's the funeral. Uh, this is West Point. There it, he is, I believe in City Hall in New York. There is the catapult there. Uh, uh, there, there is the procession is beginning to start, and I showed this picture before. Again, over a million people attended this funeral. That actually is Albany, New York. You can see the state house being built there. So, the, the, since he, this was upstate New York that he died, of course, this is where his his the first uh, uh, big uh, funeral procession. Uh, Started. There you go. This is the original site of Grant's tomb as it looked a few years before uh, it was decided to be the spot. He was put in a temporary tomb there. This decision uh, to be buried in New York uh, was decided upon by his family. Uh, uh, some people said he should have been buried in, 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 in Washington. Uh, others said West Point, but he had left instructions that he, he wanted his wife to be with him when she died. And in a, West, in a military uh, cemetery, wives were not allowed to be buried with their husbands. And so a temporary tomb was built. This uh, is uh, surrounding a plaque which was put there by the Chinese government praising Grant uh, and, and his, uh, Try and his uh, desire to try to help negotiate a peace settlement between China and Japan. The tomb is temporary tomb. There it is again. And there it is again. Again, uh, there's the designer of Grant's tomb, John H. Duncan. Uh, there it is being built, as you can see, the dome isn't up yet. It looks like there's a procession. This might have been a dedication. Uh, uh, or may, laying, I don't think it was laying of the cornerstone. Here it is under construction again, almost finished. And there's the temporary tomb behind it, which is now long gone. And there you go. I could go on. It's a big subject. I did not do it justice, I'm afraid, uh, but it is a very big subject to talk about. And go on to the uh, National Park Service, just uh, look up General Grant National Memorial, and you can get more information about about Grant, any of the parks in the New York area as well. That was fascinating. Thank you so much, Alan. My pleasure. I wish I had more time to tell you more. <laughs> the whole series has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending this afternoon and the other programs, if you attended those as well. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you've missed any, of the eight part series, please visit our YouTube channel listed under Darien Library. Thank you again and stay tuned for more exciting programs from Darien Library. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>